um, 90, 90 people sign up. We've got a complete mix of roles, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. So my name's um, Helen Balbeck. I'm Director of Policy and Services for Brains Trust, the Brain Cancer People. Um, we've also got Carol and Jody here today who are going to help facilitate. Um, so in terms of the audience, then we've got about a third who are patients and caregivers. We've got about a third of you that are healthcare professionals. And then we've got a third that are complete mystery. So it would be really <laughs> useful today if you could maybe use the chat and just let us know what your role is. So what brings you to this space today? What's your interest in um, whole genome sequencing? And we obviously will be we will be following up um, with you. Our I think you muted yourself, Helen. Then I think, okay. Um, I want to thank Brain Tumor Charity, Brain Tumor Research, Brain Tumor Support, Beanos, and the many others who promoted this uh, webinar for us. So I will be running a tight ship today. Um, most of my, my ships are I run a tight shipwreck is what I like to say. We are going to keep you muted. I'm, I don't want you to feel we're closing the conversation down, but with so many of you on the call, and we know that this is such a popular subject, I think it would be really easy for things to run away from us. So what we would like you to do is to absolutely post your questions, your comments in the chat, and we will facilitate them. If you have a question and we don't get round to it today, we will have it captured and we will be sharing it with, with the presenters, with, with Colin and Alona and Olaf today, and we will get back to you. I absolutely promise, promise that. So use the chat for comments and questions. It's always lovely to see your faces. We don't mind if your camera is on and off. And one final thing. Could you please try and keep questions relevant to everybody? I know, you know, some of you have a particular personal story. You've got you've got really major issues that you're trying to you're trying to address with whole genome sequencing and what the current state of play is. But we really don't have the space this morning to to go into personal stories. Um, so try and keep the, the questions that are relevant to everybody. Um, these are the outcomes. Hopefully by the end of this session, you'll know what whole genome sequencing is and why it's important. And Olaf's going to talk about that. We feel very privileged today. I think this is the first time we've had in the same space. We've had Genomic um, England, we've had patients and caregivers and also NHS representatives. So it's a very special moment for us. Um, Alona um, is going to talk about what does the wider political landscape look like now and in the future. I've just noticed I've left a word off there. And then Colin's going to talk about um, whole genome sequencing and how it plays out in the neuro-oncology landscape. And finally, I should probably pose the question back to our presenters, but what does this mean for me if I'm living with or I've just been diagnosed with a brain tumour? Um, because we, we know, you know that at the moment there's a lot of complexity in this field how gene genomic sequencing is being adopted and used within oncology remains unclear and I think there are issues around equity of access and I don't don't want to avoid talking about those so uh, let's get on with it we're very privileged here today to have Olaf Ansorge who's associate professor lead clinical neuropathologist in Oxford and director of the Thomas Willis Oxford Brain Collection We've also got Professor Colin Watts. He's going to be a little bit late in joining, um, but he's Professor of Neurosurgery at the Institute of Cancer and Genomic Sciences at the University of Birmingham. And both Olaf and Colin, I know, are very, very heavily involved in the Brain Matrix um, platform. And then very, very privileged to have Alona Sosinski, who's the Scientific Director for Cancer Genomics England. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now. And Olaf, I'm going to hand over to you um, so if you could cover the what and the why of whole genome sequencing, thank you very much. So thank you very much, Helen, for your introduction. Um, I hope you can see a beautiful blue sky above Oxford. Um, and I will briefly introduce myself. So I'm Olaf, I'm a consultant neuropathologist, and I'm coordinating uh, the tissue pathway for the brain matrix study, but I'm also trying to help those centers in the UK that are not part of the brain matrix study to uh, allow patients who get diagnosed with brain tumors um, get access to 
for genome sequencing. So I will briefly explain how we have diagnosed brain tumors uh, in the past. So we follow an international classification uh, established for many years by the World Health Organization or the WHO. And essentially over the last 30, 40 years, the classification has evolved from purely microscopic examination of a biopsy to the combination of microscopic examination and genomics. And the genomics is of course the topic of today. And I will talk about how the genomics technology has or is allowing us to get ever more precise information about the nature of the brain tumor. So essentially, um, as I said, some people call the WHO also the WHO. So we are moving from seeing is believing, which you can see in the bottom left, which has served us well for 40, 50 years of brain tumor diagnostics, to believing, meaning believing what the accurate diagnosis is, is seeing what's under the microscope, so the cellular composition of a tumor, plus the molecular or genetic nature of the tumor. And to accommodate these diverse findings, the WHO and all international neuropathologists have agreed that they will work towards an integrated diagnosis that incorporates all these features and, and, and reflects the current state of the art of our knowledge. Now, I have to say that these things are still evolving, and this is essentially a concept which gets updated every few years to allow us to make better predictions and identify better treatments. Now, making sense of DNA. So where does so-called whole genome sequencing fit in? So like in many areas of our lives, technology drives progress. So on this slide, you see on the left, the famous double helix. And as you may know, there is a very nice and strict rule of four bases that pair to each other in a stereotypical way. And the nature of the pairing determines the sequence of a gene and overall the sequence of the whole gene, the genome, which means all the letters that combine the entire um, DNA structure of a human cell or person. And how this has evolved over the last 40 years is essentially through three evolutions of technology, which you can see on the right. So the first one, which we now call first generation sequencing or classically Sanger sequencing name, named after Frederick Sanger who discovered this is essentially in a simple form, you can analyze one gene at a time. You know, there are thousands of genes. You could do one gene or a few genes at a time. And also for Sanger se sequencing, you actually had somehow to know what you are looking for. Now, next or second generation sequencing is what also includes whole genome sequencing. And that is called sequencing by synthesis. And it's dominated by one company called Illumina. And the principle is essentially that fragments of DNA will be synthesized into a new strand and then assembled and then matched against a reference genome. And that can happen in parallel and is very fast and individual dyes are attached to any of the individual bases. And then one can, like a puzzle, um, arrive at the whole genome DNA sequence. And there are variations of this second generation sequencing. This is from many genes. So one can select panels of 20, 30 genes that one thinks are relevant for a certain disease, or one can go for the whole genome with this method. And that's what we call that whole genome sequencing. And the difference to the first generation is essentially that this can be done in an unbiased fashion. That means you, can, you don't need to know what you're looking for. And this allows you to discover new variations that may be associated with disease. And then there's already a third generation or long read sequencing on the horizon where one of the big um, players is from the UK, Oxford Nanopore, where the fragments are uh, uh, kept longer 
which is easier than to put the puzzle together. So one learns certain aspects of the structure of the genome and the chromosomes with long read sequencing that is currently difficult to decipher with um, short read sequencing. But I will focus now on whole genome sequencing because that is a now a mature technology and that is what currently is uh, applied to or is rolled out um, for brain tumor um, analysis. So what can this do? So here's a summary how this would work for a brain tumor patient. So each cell contains chromosomes and you can select cell types and compare the genome of the cell type. So in the top left, you see one cell and that could be a normal blood cell, which is non-cancerous and a cell or cells from a brain tumor. The DNA is extracted. As I said, fragments are used and prepared for sequencing. That is done in an Illumina machine and the color coding then allows you to assemble a full genome. And then here you can see what the whole purpose of this is. So you have the genome of blood cells as a reference from what is believed to be the normal sequence in your body versus the sequence from the glioma, either an individual cell or you know, the whole average variation within a tumor that has been removed. And then you can compare the individual basis across the whole genome and identify what is private to the tumor, which means cancer as a largely genetic disease has changes that are not present in the blood cell. And those changes can be used to refine the genetic or genomic architecture of a given tumor. So to zo uh, zoom in on this um, last point, so what can we potentially do with the output of these whole genome sequences? So essentially, as I said, we could discover any genetic change that is private to the tumor in an unbiased fashion. What this will potentially give us is more information that things that look the same under the a microscope or look the same on an MRI scan may actually genetically distinct um, types of tumor, and that then may need to a refined classification of tumors, so identification of new subtypes that behave in a different way. And then, of course, the main hope is um, that there are certain treatments that are much more tailored to an individual, individual's tumor that, uh, that can be targeted against certain changes that are present in the DNA uncovered by whole genome sequencing. So that's the promise. Now, briefly to conclude, um, I will talk about the landscape in the UK and the challenges that we face. So I'm working in the Brain Matrix project, which is uh, linked to the Tessa Jowell Brain Cancer Mission. And you can see here uh, Tessa Jowell, as you know, she was a um, uh, 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 Baroness Jowell and suffered from a glioblastoma while in the House of Lords and then said, if I have one legacy that the care and diagnosis and management of people with brain tumors in the UK improves. So as you all have experienced probably, brain tumors are somehow an orphan tumor type. It doesn't get the attention that more common tumors get. So what is happening in the UK now is that initially through Brain Matrix, but now commissioned for all NHS patients in England, that anybody who is newly diagnosed with a brain tumor and has surgery which produces some tissue is eligible for whole genome sequencing in addition to the standard diagnostics using microscopes or older genetic technologies. And that is arranged through seven genomic hubs, which have opened recently in England. It's not available at the moment in Scotland and, and, and Wales. And the challenge is that we find, and then I've spent most of last year dealing with is that the government has said, oh, it's all commissioned, it's all open, it's all wonderful. 
anybody should have access. In reality, um, the pathway, how you go from brain surgery to having the right type of tissue in the right state and then getting it to the sequencing hubs and then get the data analyzed in a timely fashion so it can inform potential new trials or treatments, that is clearly not yet established. So there is a lot of work to be done. It's not glamorous work. It is essentially nitty gritty of how to get from surgery a sample to whole genome sequencing to then meaningful input into patient management. And that will take a lot of work, which um, Colin and I and others here are, and Alona are, are very much trying to achieve. And on that uh, note, I just want to end. And I think I'm happy to take questions unless questions are bundled up at the end. Thank you, Olaf. No, it so will. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are going to take questions at the end of each speaker, and there will be opportunity for a wider discussion at the end. Um, so we have one uh, from Grant, who is um, living with a GBM4, and he says he sees some progress has been made in labs in Israel and the USA, um, and presumably UK, Germany, etc., in using genome sequencing to develop a cure. But how far off are we from using this viably for treating and curing? The GBM4, and I, for me, I think it's it's shaping that virtuous circle where you know you can identify patients um, for personalized or stratified treatments. But at the moment, my feeling is we don't always have the treatments. So, what is needed to complete that circle? Yes. Yes. So. Yes, I agree with what uh, Helen just said. So progress, as I said, is being made in the UK. And in, in fact, I think that this is rolled out nationally and offered nationally is pretty unique for the UK. So the UK is at the forefront of trying to make this accessible to everybody with a brain tumor. Now, that is already a positive move. Now, speed is, of course, always a big concern. These things, unfortunately, uh, move slowly. And what I call the gap between knowledge and what we can do for an individual patient. It was, you know, when I started my career and we did only microscopy for diagnosis, the gap between what we could do diagnostically and predicting the future of a brain tumor and what we could do therapeutically was relatively small. It's now getting bigger and bigger, but I hope that this will be a temporary increase in the gap. So we get better and better and better at defining the tumors. And what is lacking at the moment is that this knowledge is um, translated into new treatments. So but that has is happening in all uh, of, of, of genomic or personalized medicine. First, you have to acquire the knowledge, then you have to understand the knowledge, and then becomes a very, very laborious um, long-winded way that you test new drugs against the new targets that you may have uncovered through sequencing. And then before you can give it to a patient, you also, of course, have to have some pharmaceutical company involved to uh, have a compound that is then sufficiently ready so you can trial it in some patients. So I'm aware that this is one of the biggest concerns and questions. It's not surprising. It's the first question you know, what's all the fuss about? What will it do for me? You still give me just timozolomide and radiation. And all I can say, um, progress in my career, I'm now 20, 30 years doing what I'm doing. The progress is rapid. It has made a difference in being able to predict how a tumor will behave, the natural course of a tumor. And we are beginning now, and Colin will probably speak more about that. We are beginning to find so-called basket trials where, for example, in melanoma, a treatment was successful because there's a common mutation. And some glioblastoma patients have also this common mutation. And we know that the treatment against this mutation works in the melanoma. So although it is very rare in glioblastoma, there may be a few people who would benefit from this treatment and this sort of flexible design of 
trials and new treatments is what we are all working on. And I think nobody can honestly predict how fast there will be success or breakthroughs. What I can tell you is that these glioblastomas and brain tumors are unfortunately one of the most difficult and complex tumors that can befall us as human beings. Thank you. So one, uh, we've got two more questions. Um, what is the potential, we've got Carolina from Spain, what's the potential for transferring um, samples cross-border? And you know, on a local scale, we know this is only in England, so I know there will be, be members of the community in Scotland and in Wales who would immediately feel they're being denied equity of access. So we've got the cross-border locally, but then also from country to country. How, how possible is it to, to transfer samples? Yeah, so first to, yeah, so first to, to address the concerns about uh, transfer and access, equity of access within the UK. So within Brain Matrix, we had funding to do it also for, for Wales and, and, and Scotland, and that funding is likely to be renewed again. Now, cross-border transfer of samples is always a bureaucratic problem. And the other complication, speaking uh, as you know, somebody who works in England, is that, of course, this is commissioned for patients who are resident in the UK and not for patients resident elsewhere. Um, on private... Um, with private arrangements, either with genomics companies or oncology companies, this is generally possible, but it is very, very expensive. And I'm not aware yet that a network has been formed within Europe where people are asking the question, how could access to whole genome sequencing be widened beyond the UK borders. As far as I'm aware, um, the UK is the only country where there is within the context of the National Health Service, such a service commissioned. So it's a very new thing. So we are learning also what it can do. It's not okay. something that we that has been established in America or something and we, we just implement it. This is really being at the forefront of learning and then ideally, of course, as an academic and somebody who comes from Europe, you know, sharing it with as many people as possible, our experience. Okay, thank you. So Carolina, we will follow up with you because we have had patients who have had um, tissue transferred cross-border. And just one more question before we move on to Alona. So this is from Louise. Do you foresee a use of off-label targeted drugs such as TKIs, T TKIs following the use of whole genome sequencing in brain tumors to identify gene aberrations, particularly in G GBM, due to the lack of tailored treatment options available under the NHS standard of care? Yes, so I'm aware that certain off-label treatments are sometimes um, initiated. I cannot comment uh, uh, exactly how widespread that may be over the next few years, but I know of some instances in pediatric brain cancers and others where a case can be made um, to use certain novel approaches off label. Okay. But again, that is, is, is generally has to be arranged then. One has to find a sympathetic uh, oncologist or a research environment where this is done. I did it's done in a trial or sometimes private companies, but one never knows what they are selling you. So some of these, you know, may sell more hope than reality, which is, of course, ethically debatable. Okay, thank you, Ola. Thank you very, very much. Right, can I um, <clears throat> hand over the reins now to Alona, who's going to share with us the wider political landscape, what it looks like now, and where things are heading in the future. So welcome, Alona, and thank you very much for coming along today. Can you hear me now? Oh, I cannot hear you. 
Uh, no, I, I'm muted. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm you, Keith. <laughs> um, well, I, I uh, dropped here the, the, the word political through, from the title. <laughs> Let's move it to the landscape of the cool genome sequencing. That's for... fine. That's fine. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, thank you, Ken, for the invitation and for the um presenting me. I will just repeat that I'm coming from the Genomics England. I'm scientific director for, for Cancer Day. Um, sometimes people um, misunderstand the role of the Genomics England. We are not NHS, uh, but we are funded by the Department of Health and NHS is our main customer. Um, and Um, and here is the slide which explains uh, what is the genomics in England, what is our position in the landscape. Um, and there were some questions to all of like, um, okay, you find the mutations in the patient genome, what's next? And we probably today, um, th these um, opportunities are a bit limited, although all of showed some like weak routes for the repurposing drugs. Um, but our overall strategy is kind of represented by this infinity loop. Uh, so on the left hand side is what is happening today uh, in the clinic and how we try to help diagnose patients and tailor patients' treatments. Um, genomic uh, uh, laboratories are um, pathologists, um, clinicians, are recruiting patients for the whole genome sequencing. Patients are signing consent. Um, this consent is covering sequencing for the clinical purposes, but very importantly, patients also have an option uh, to consent use of the genomic data for research purposes. Um, so it goes through this clinical um, genomic sequence, uh, genome gets sequenced, and then it goes through this um, circle on the left hand side, um, data get analyzed and interpreted, it goes back to the genomic lab, um, to the molecular tumor board where uh, patient data, genomic data and clinical data get discussed uh, by the group of clinicians, oncologists, pathologists, hematologists, if it's uh, blood cancers, uh, geneticists, and so on, and uh, many uh, pa uh, decisions about patient management are made based on this uh, genomic and clinical uh, information presented. But as I said, it's not the end of the um, journey. Uh, if patient opted um, opt in use of the genomic data for, for the research, um, genomic data and clinical data go into our secure research environment where it's get available for, for the research, for the clinical research, and also for the basic scientific research. So this is where we expect uh, breakthrough treatments, breakthrough happening, uh, new uh, targets are found for the, for the targeted treatment, new drugs get developed. Um, and then all this, um, breaking edge research goes feedback into our clinical loop. Uh, so we can do uh, new types of the analysis for the genomic data, find new markers which can be relevant to the patient treatment. So this is how we see this landscape of the genomic research. Uh, data that we collect as a part of our clinical circle goes uh, shared with the uh, researchers, uh, I will just stress again, it's all dependent on uh, consent that patients give for the use of their data. And then these new findings, they feed back to the new types of the analysis that we're doing for our clinical patients. This is um, the part of the loop that I was showing on the left-hand side, uh, like the clinical loop. As I said, patients should get uh, consented and sample collected um, in the hospitals. DNA get extracted at genomic labs and sent to Illumina for sequencing. That's all of very nicely described. Then it goes to the Genomics England for the analysis. So we find this, we call it variant calling. We find these um, mutations in the genome which can drive cancer that can be 
targeted with treatments which can help to refine patient diagnosis or provide uh, predict patient prognosis. Uh, these variants also can make patient eligible for the clinical trials. Um, so we do in like automated interpretation and outcomes are sent to the genomic labs where our results are reviewed by the clinical scientists and presented on the um, <clears throat> multidisciplinary tumor boards. Um, and then the cycle is completed by the um, refining patient management. Uh, here is just one of the success stories. Um, I didn't uh, pull patient with the brain cancer. I um, we working very closely with pediatric um, uh, pediatric oncologist and hematologist from the Great Ormond Street. Uh, so this is a slide from our collaborator on uh, pediatric hematological cancers. Um, at the moment, I think we are very close to recruiting 100% of pediatric patients from Great Ormond Street um, for, for the full genome sequencing. It's uh, proved to be very successful, give a lot of insights for, for patient treatment. So that was the case of the 11 months old patient with very mixed uh, phenotype for the acute leukemias. Those types of cancers are usually very hard to treat. Um, and standard of care genomic testing didn't find any abnormalities, was sent to the whole genome sequencing. Um, it finds a very unusual fusion between, uh, between these two genes. Um, why these findings were so uh, important? Well, first we understood was, was driving this leukemia so we can make prognosis for patient, how patient respond to treatment. It's also very important to know specific rearrangements in patient genome. So we can start treating patients and repeatedly check um, if these fusions, if these rearrangements still present in the genome. If it disappear, then it's um, very likely that patients respond to treatment very efficiently and um, disease is cured for now. Also, there is a new treatment uh, for patients with this specific rearrangement. So we can use these treatments in the future if patients stop responding to the, uh, to the standard of care chemical therapies. Uh, so this is just one of uh, very many stories of success. Um, so this is our settings, and I will go through it very quickly because um, all of already mentioned some of it. We collect in two samples from each of our cancer patients. One sample is tumor, um, and another sample is just blood. Is kind of reference. Uh, this is a genome that patients receive at birth. So we can compare these two genomes and see what actually changed in the tumor. So one of those changes in the tumor, or sometimes several changes in the tumor genome, is what is causing uh, development of this tumor, is what we can target uh, with targeted drugs, is what can predict uh, patient um, prognosis and patient respond to treatment. And also, as I said, can make patient eligible for the clinical trial. So one of the uh, big challenges specifically for the whole genome sequencing is that we want to collect, uh, we want to sequence DNA which was extracted from the fresh frozen tissue. And <laughs> I can say it's a very political problem. Um, traditionally, uh, tumor tissues are dropped into the formalin to fix it, to prevent further um, destruction. Um, and unfortunately, once you drop tissue into the formalin, uh, you cause a lot of um, a lot of rearrangements of the DNA, a lot of fragmentation of the DNA. Um, so these DNA um, sequences, which are read from this DNA, will be very difficult to analyze. Um, and this is a change that we have to do in the local pathway in the hospitals. And so once biopsy is taken or tumor is removed, it can be dropped into the 
liquid nitrogen. And I'm just showing here graphical representation of the genomic data. What it looks like on the right hand side, if you drop tissue into the formalin of the left hand side is if you dropped it into the liquid nitrogen and DNA is much better preserved. Like for example, the middle part of this circus plot is all these rearrangements between the chromosomes. And one of them uh, can actually drive cancer development. So if you look at the left-hand side, there are very few of them. There's rearrangements between chromosomes. Uh, and it's much easier to make interpretation of this data than if you look at the right-hand side and you see how many rearrangements were caused by the formalin. It's almost impossible to find this needle in this tick, this strider for tumor. Uh, which can tailor patient treatment. But as I said, um, it's not a trivial task to li take liquid nitrogen close to the site where biopsy was taken or to the uh, surgery theater. So this is one of the challenges that we have to solve uh, to make sure that all patients go for the full genome sequencing testing. Uh, this is just some types of arrangements that we try to identify. Uh, through the whole genome sequencing. And very importantly, we can use this single test to cover this, uh, we call them spelling mistakes, uh, like the changes of the one nucleotide in the chromosomal sequencing. Or sometimes the entire chromosome get amplified, so you have multiple copies of the same chromosome. Or probably a, just a small bit of the chromosome get amplified many, many times. Um, we've seen it uh, like in a gene which is very, very relevant for the brain tumors, EGFR, instead of usual two copies, you can suddenly see 50. Um, and I also touched a bit uh, fusions, it's then two chromosomes stick together. And at the place where they stick together, you get this hybrid protein, um, which also can have drastic effects to the, to the cell functioning and can drive tumor development. So we get very organized with NHS and in England, um, and a couple of years ago, NHS published um, a launch genomic medicine services as a part of it launch national genomic test directory. Um, everyone can Google it. It's publicly available. Uh, just go to the Google and type National Genomic Test Directory. At the moment, it exists as Excel spreadsheet. Um, hopefully soon we will move to, to, to something more <laughs> high techy. So it lists all the clinical indications and or for the for the cancer, also for the rare disease and all the genomic tests that you can do for each of these indications. And so also explain what's the technology uh, you can use to run this genomic testing, what's the targets, what's the genes um, you have to, to cover with your genomic testing. Um, so the intention is that uh, at least in England, all patients are um, eligible for the same set of genomic testing and equity of access, of course. Um, as a part of this national test directory, um, so na national test directory um, lists all the indications for which we can do full genome sequencing. At the beginning, it was available for the um, pediatric cancers, hematological cancers, and all sarcoma tumors. Um, and uh, from the last year, um, we had a wave two clinical indications also incorporated in the national test directory and as a part of it, it are neurological tumors. Um, and this test directory is constantly evolving. So once we provide evidence uh, for the additional tests to be incorporated into the test directory, um, quality committee is reviewing proposals and, to, and deciding whether to incorporate new tests that all patients in England have to be eligible for. So we have now this ecosystem in place. Uh, we have national test directory, which lists all the tests that patients are eligible for. 
Um, all of already covered this uh, seven genomic club hubs um, across England who are uh, recruiting patients, extracting DNA, send it to Genomics England. Um, we have analytical pipeline and Genomics England um, that identify these um, variants in the in the genome that can drive cancer, that can make patient eligible for the uh, treatments, um, also refined diagnosis. And we already have established a molecular tumor boards at the, at the hospitals who are reviewing the results and make um, recommendations for patient treatment. Um, so ecosystem is in place. As I said, we still have a lot of challenges with, with collecting samples. We can improve interpre um, interpretation. Uh, we can make uh, GDAP working much more efficiently and faster. Um, and one of the reasons we uh, we want to do whole genome sequencing, just look at how small is the samples. And if you go through the list of tests um, for which patients are eligible, you can see that this small piece of tissue have to be split among so many different tests, um, which been around for quite some time. And of course, ambition is that uh, all this testing can be done um, with the full genome sequencing as a one-stop shop, um, which cover all these different types of rearrangement and provide you a lot of information. We just have to become better in reading this information and making its interpretation. So this is just a short summary that whole genome sequencing is now delivered through the um, NHS Genomic Medicine Services and National Test Directory. Um, it's a one-stop uh, shop for finding different uh, types of variants. Um, one of the serious barriers um, is the quality of the DNA that we collect. And I uh, covered a bit like how we make all of this data, okay, given the uh, patient consented for the, uh, for the use in a research together with clinical information uh, patient treatment and outcomes of treatment to promote, to, to, to energize research, new types of analysis and drug development. So I think I will stop here. A huge thank you, Alona. We have had some um, nice comments about the, the infinity loop model and very clear explanations. So thank you for that. I think I've got about three or four questions. Um, we've got somebody who's um, in the infinity loop at the moment, and there's a question about timing. In an ideal world, how long would it take to do that complete loop? The clinical part of the loop now is taking two, three weeks. Okay. I don't think I can comment on the turnaround times for developing new therapies. Um, I think all of touched very relevant point on the drug repurposing. Uh, so this is probably can be very relevant uh, for the current patients. Um, if you see mutations for which drugs are developed and approved for other clinical indications, can, repurpose, can you repurpose, repurpose them for the, for the patient you see today? Um, so this is probably the fastest that we can do. New drugs, of course, takes a while, but there are always new clinical trials open. Um, and we still struggle with the national database of clinical trials. Uh, but I know that uh, there is a new development in the um, experimental medicine centers. Um, so at least now we have a database of clinical trials which cover these early phases clinical trials it's now available to everyone in NHS. Okay, thank you. And I, I think maybe this is a, a question for Colin. Um, there's a question there about does it vary from center to center um, and from your perspective from cancer type to cancer type. So for example, with breast, is it quicker to close the infinity loop with maybe, maybe a less common or rarer cancer where it may take longer? Because we feel there is a mismatch between um, the aspirations and the ambition, but also the resources that are available on the ground.
that I don't know if that's a question for you or for Colin. Colin, probably handle it to you. Okay. You're muted, Colin. Mute. Yes. There you go. Right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be answering that question. With, okay, with... we'll come back to that one then. Very Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so a question from Alison. How old does the DNA sample have to be? Or, you know, is there a point where maybe it would reach its expiry date? I would say that um, sometimes we have to sequence a stop DNA is very um, stable, unless you put it into the phone. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. If it just frozen at minus twenty, it can be stored for a few years. Of course, fresh, uh, freshly extracted DNA is always better. Uh, sometimes you store samples in the liquid nitrogen, and then you extract DNA just before the test. Okay, thank you. So, Jody has um, posted up um, the know-how that we we produced with with BNOS, the British Neuro Oncology Society, which explains the current situation around tissue collection, because we know that there are some centres that are still putting in paraffin blocks and there are other centres that are freezing tissue. But if you could all read Olaf's comment where there is an ambition collectively um, to overcome the system inertia. I like that phrase to, to make sure that everybody has um, equity, equity in the way their brain tumour tissue is preserved. And then from Will, there's a bit multiple questions here but it's all about the same theme. Is the genomic information useful in isolation or is a wider picture of the person important? And if so, what is important here and how are the data aligned? And how does this then inform clinical decision-making where with whom do the decisions lie? <laughs> yes, of course, then um, you discuss uh, patient genomic data on the on the multidisciplinary tumor board, you have to have access to, to the pathology data. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe all of want to, to touch on it. Um, we start developing a decision support system for the for the cancer patients. And at the moment it's mainly focused on the genomic data, but my vision for the few years ahead is that a multidisciplinary board just sit in the room with multiple screens. So you have all the information put together together with image data. And actually I would like to start doing automatic, automatic interpretation uh, where you have genomic data and image data together because we just start using artificial intelligence on making interpretation of the image data. If we can merge it together with genomic and it, it would provide much deeper insight. Okay, thank you. Two more questions. What is the split in mandate between the GMS and GEL? And what is the current coverage of sequencing for cancer patients? Um, coverage of sequencing, we're doing tumors at 100x. Uh, we're doing germlines at 30x. Is it technical coverage you are asking about? I don't know, SCOMA. I don't know if you wanted to clarify your question. I can't, more geographic, thank you. Um, you know, I would say that at the moment we have these um, hubs of excellence, like for example, for pediatric tumors, we see a lot of uh, submissions from Otherbrook Hospital from the Great Ormond Street. So I would say it's still the, the, the geographic, we get recruitment from all seven genomic lab hubs. But it's not very even. Some people, uh, some centers are more uh, efficient in recruiting hematological tumors. Some centers are more efficient in in recruiting brain tumors. It's not very even. Okay, thank you. And then, is whole genome sequencing some something that is done automatically, or do people need to request it? Um, it it's usually pathologist who is ordering tests. But you know, talk with your oncologist. Yeah. We had <laughs> very touchy case when um, I think it was um, a single mom who came to one of our pediatricians and said that uh, she heard that there is a full genome sequencing can help your child and she wanted to start crowdfunding. And a uh, pediatrician was very proud to say that, you know, NHS is already covering costs. 
Uh, and we see more and more patients coming to their um, treatment clinicians asking about whole genome sequencing. Okay, thank you so much, Alona. That was very insightful and, and hugely helpful. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Colin Watts now, and I think he will also um, bring some additionality to the, the two talks we've had already. So Colin, over to you. I can't see Colin. Is he on mute? Or has he not started? No. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Right, now. right okay. Um, so, let me start again. Okay, thank you. Um, hopefully, um, I'll be able to answer some of the questions that, that have been posed, um, or at least embellish the answers that have already been given. The purpose of this talk is really to uh, explain some of the real world stuff. And in as I begin, um, I want to acknowledge both Olaf and Alona, with whom I have worked a lot. Um, uh, in terms of some of the work that is very much an ongoing project and some issues that hopefully we can continue to work together to iron out. Um, for this audience, I don't really need to tell you that glioma is a bit of a problem and that it's a case of unmet need. Um, it's supposed to be an uncommon tumour, but when you start talking to people, it's quite surprising how many people know someone who's had a brain tumour, but maybe that's just my heightened awareness of it. But what is true is that the morbidity and, and, and cancer deaths associated with brain tumors are significant compared to their incidence, and that's an important uh, consideration. Equally, you'll be aware that whether you have an IDH mutant tumor, an IDH wild type tumor, in other words, an oligodendroglioma or an astrocytoma, whether it's 1P codonide deleted or not, and so on, at the end of the day, you have radiotherapy and then a, uh, either either lumosteen PCV chemotherapy or temozolomide. And PCV chemotherapy and temozolomide are basically the same mechanism of action. It's a carpet bombing technique to try and kill as many cells as possible. It is not particularly specific or precision medicine. That's not for want of trying. This slide illustrates loads and loads of drugs. It's old now. It's 10 years old. Um, every one of those drugs has been tried in, in, in a dish, in animal models. It's been shown to be effective in mice with a brain tumor. All of them have failed when it comes to trialing in humans with a brain tumor. And that track record, I'm afraid, continues. This is an editorial uh, published in the January edition of Neuro-Oncology this year, um, following a, a, a tranche of further negative trials and posing six elements or six challenges um, that are associated with uh, the poor pro the, the difficulties of getting therapies to patients. And some of these include a lack of clinical trial infrastructure to evaluate novel agents and problems with trial design and how we assess response. And the reason for this is, is very briefly, is the way that we do experiments. So the way that we do experiments is we take a, take a model, whether that's in a dish or in a mouse or whatever, and we vary one thing at a time so that we can see if that particular thing that we vary influences things. And what that means in terms of medical treatments is it's, it's, it means that the treatments are, are driven through a particular disease. We have drugs for breast cancer, drugs for... Uh, uh, lung cancer uh, and drugs, drugs for prostate cancer and so on. And the way that they're normally tested is, is additive. And what that means is you do a trial where you randomize patients to either standard of care or standard of care plus X, where X is your new drug. And in brain cancer, that strategy has 
uh, has been failing now for the, for, for the last two decades. Increasingly, what we recognize is that there are dynamic relationships. So we, we look at things in a different way. Instead of targeting drugs for lung cancer or breast cancer, we target drugs for specific targets that we can identify from, from changes in the genome and, and, and other bits and pieces so that we can use the same drug in different patients because we're targeting the lesion and that we're, that we're looking for synergy between multiple different drug types. And that's the future uh, that we're trying to get to. And that informs clinical trial design, which I'll come on to later. So therefore, um, what we want to do is to sort of start to think about how we can change the landscape and what we can do to, to, to start that process. And the first thing that you can do is actually understand what happens to the patient and to understand that in detail and then ensure that patients are managed through specialist care pathways. And in some centers, that is still presenting a challenge. There is still resistance to doing that. But if you can do that, you can then build around that an infrastructure that includes the clinic, it includes the operating room, and it includes laboratories and research environments. And so that means that you can, in the clinic, talk to patients about doing things differently including and specifically collecting tissue. So for example, in our institution, patients are consented for whole genome sequencing in the clinic, and it's done by the NHS nurses, because not only are they a brilliant team, they, they have grasped the fact that specialization and putting patients in their care pathway at the center is critical. And then we've got some, some surgeons who are engaged, they will collect tissue specifically and do so in a thoughtful and intelligent manner and make sure that those that, that tissue can then be conveyed to the lab in an efficient, uh, efficient way. But that is still very much a work in progress because the whole thing is about creating what I refer to as an adaptive learning environment. And that's for the whole patient journey from the point uh, at which you first present to a specialist multidisciplinary team all the way through to the great inevitable at the other end of that, uh, that journey. And so we want to capture why some patients with a glioblastoma are alive at five years and some patients are not. And that's an example of the clinical diversity of phenotype that we see in the real world. We want to look at all types of glioma because we want to capture the rare. And as we start stratifying patients, breaking them up into groups based on uh, the, 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 the biology and analysis of their genetics, for example, many types of brain cancer become increasingly rare. We need multiple types of data and we need to integrate that, collate it and use it. And we need to turn that whole thing around in a time frame that is clinically relevant both to the patient and to those uh, treating them. And we need to set standards, set standards for excellence. Whole genome sequencing is uh, supposed to be standard of care. It, we're not there yet. We're still on that early phase of the journey. So with that background, the idea behind uh, the, the Tessagile Brain Matrix platform was a strategic program that would establish a national clinical network, and that is still a work in progress. It would employ state-of-the-art diagnostics, um, recognizing at the time we were developing this back in 2018, that methylation arrays were, were important in diagnostics. And that is still a work in progress, getting that into NHS routine care. And then we want to integrate all of that genomic data, the, the, the work that Olaf and, and Alona have been talking about, into routine NHS practice. We were future-proofing this five years ago, and that is still a work in progress. And we need to do it at the early phase of, of trial development, as, as indicated by by those concerns raised in the editorial published this month. So we need to do that in a specialist context. So the Brain Matrix platform was then conceived as, as basically integrating data with the object of trying to deliver clinical therapeutics at the end of it. So it's about taking the biology of the tumor, the, the clinic, what's been happening to the patient, the clinical data, together with the imaging data and integrating all of that in order to provide rapid and, and accurate molecular diagnosis along the lines that you've heard from the previous speakers and deliver clinical trials of new therapies going forward into the future. 
to act as a data repository because data is the zeitgeist of the 21st century. It's where all of our information needs to be. And we need to enrich that data further so that we can understand the impact of having asthma or diabetes on the management of patients with brain tumors. Because if you've got diabetes and you're on steroids, you're getting a double whammy because you, steroids promote sugar retention, which is at the heart of diabetes. And we're currently not collecting that kind of information. We want to facilitate engagement into, into clinical trials within Brain Matrix and beyond. We're not interested in creating a two-tier system, but we want to try and make it as easy as possible. And so one of the, in order to take part in Brain Matrix, all you need to do is be eligible for a surgical operation. Now, the surgical operations are going on, but the recruitment into Brain Matrix is patchy. And the reason for that is that even when we make it as simple as possible to recruit patients into a brain cancer study, the resources just aren't there in terms of research nurses, in terms of clinic facilities to actually recruit patients. The objectives of, of Brain Matrix, um, to a certain extent, were number one, uh, an objective that's looking at the feasibility and process-centered objectives. And that's some of the data that I'll be presenting today but also to look at that, that whole time frame uh, from taking the tissue, from getting consent, taking the tissue, and then getting that, that material used in terms of an advanced diagnosis, integrated molecular diagnosis, and informing therapeutic decision-making. In other words, to do this, we then have to set up a strategy that synergizes with the NHS GMS. And bear in mind, this, this original thinking is, is now five years old, but we're still in the process of developing this ecosystem. And that is what it is. It is a research ecosystem that is based on understanding what happens to the patient, recognizing the importance of genomic-based uh, 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 classification, diagnosis, treatment, and understanding how best we can revise that diagnosis to understand how the genomics, how the biology changes as treatment progresses. This is the same slide in a different format. What this is showing are all the bits and pieces that we have to link together in order to deliver that data integration, the radiological, clinical, and biological. And what I want to draw your attention to is the often forgotten, and certainly uh, Olaf and I hadn't really planned it when we were, we were looking at developing Brain Matrix, but the huge operational challenges in making this whole system work. It begins with the patient, ensuring they have access to trials, ensuring that we collect patient report com reported outcomes, quality of life, ensuring that the patients get the support to make the right decisions for them, equality, diversity, and inclusivity. We need to reach out to all cultural groups to encourage them to participate. We need to get consent. We need to get consent for trials. We need to get consent for research. We need to engage with public and patient carers, understand regulations, and look at shared decision-making in that process. And then we need to link all that to the samples that we collect. And again, we'll come on to that in, in, in a minute, but you take the samples, how do you store them? How do you move them from A to B? How do you process them and how do you quality assure everything and how do you track it? How do you know that a sample's left and it's on its way to, to, to one of the labs for, 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 for processing? And then the type of, of analysis that we do, what, we, what, we, what we're looking at at the moment is whole genome sequencing because as Olaf said, it is mature technology. Some would argue it's old, it, it, it needs to be updated by integrating things like methylation sequencing, transcriptional profiling, digital pathology and long read versus short read sequencing, which Olaf alluded to, which Alona, Alona has mentioned in the context of where do we go next? How can we improve and develop a one-stop shop for analysis? And finally, and by no means least, we need to create an environment where we can engage with commercial partners in a meaningful dialogue to provide access to not only to drugs, but to new diagnostic technologies and processing technologies. So the pathway, the, the, the journey uh, from the point at which the, the tissue is collected, how it is processed, uh, is, is something that has been driving Olaf 
quietly insane uh, in terms of setting it up for a long time. But essentially, the idea is that the site would take samples, that it would se send it to the Oxford Lab for Methylation Array, and it would send it to the Genomic Laboratory Hub for processing, which would then get done by Illumina. And then the results would come back through the GLH and be discussed to GTAB as Alona uh, indicated. However, there are minor challenges, one of which is that Scotland population about 10 million and Wales population under a million or so um, doesn't have the equivalent of genomic laboratory hubs. So how can we help them? And here the pathway is slightly different. And again, um, Olaf and his team have been important in, in ensuring to try and get that through, through the research pathway. But unfortunately, the, the Genomic England research pipeline uh, ends at the end of, uh, of March. So what do we do next going forward to ensure equity of access for everybody? <coughs> so what progress have we been made in Brain Matrix as an example of prospective data collection in the real world? We've got over 230 patients registered now, but only 14 have completed the pathway from consent and tissue collections all the way through to a GTAB. We have multiple GTABs. Um, that there are there are seven in, across the UK, as as you've um, indicated as previously. We have representation in Brain Matrix of the northeast, the northwest, the east of England, the southeast, and the central and south. We do not have representation from from the southwest, which is based in Bristol, and Bristol is one of the centres we would like to open, um, and we do not have. Um, representation in the North Thames GLH. But again, um, we're talking to Barts and others to see if we can uh, improve that access. Because our problem is that the time it is taking for this process to happen is far too long. Um, and the caveat here is that this includes patients early on in our experience. So patients one and two, for example, where it's taken years to, to get the material uh, processed properly. And as you'll notice, more recently, um, our timeline has improved. So we are, all, we are improving. It's not all doom and gloom. But one of the things that we've been able to do, because this is a prospective study rather than retrospective capture of data, is we've been able to try and summarize um, each step in the pathway right. from surgery through sample submission, sample processing, submission to, to gel, uh, a gel analysis and turnaround, uh, the GTAB meetings, and then the, the subsequent reports and actioning. And we've been able to divide it into these different sections and look at the time it's taking on average across the 14 samples that we've been able to analyze. I should point out that there are, there are another 40 odd in the pipeline um, waiting to be processed. Um, and again, the, the problem there is that the processing time is challenging because it is it is the time taken to understand get get the get the uh, material to to the analyzed and then uh, interpret it and report it. We'll come on to that as we go through, but there are steps each way. The actual analysis time is good, but there's a lot going around the infrastructure, the operational infrastructure and also um, the, the, the return infrastructure for reporting this that we can come on to. So the current activity of what we're doing involves tissue collection, sample tracking, working with the network of, of GLH, uh, genomic laboratory hubs, engaging with the devolved nations, the diagnosis, the delivery of the GTABs and, and, and the acceleration of those. Um, hang on, sorry.
I think there are some big questions around the amount of time that it takes at the moment to process these samples. It was like, was it 408 days? But yeah, we can so, ask sorry, about sorry that. about that. Um, That's okay, Colin. Yeah, okay. uh, it, 408 days. Um, we, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is the air, this is the sort of scope of things that we're covering at the moment, and going forward, this is the additional activity um, that that is going to have to be um, delivered, particularly around understanding how we can improve access to new drugs, how we can develop commercial partnerships, and how we can do the education um, and capacity building because one of the things that we need is we need more oncologists to engage with the Genomic Tumor Advisory Board, and we need more people to facilitate the operational pipeline to collect the samples, complete the paperwork, and make sure that, that, that that's done in a quick and timely manner. And then there are, there are the stakeholders and partners, Genome England for the analysis pipeline, NHS England for the operational infrastructure, as an example. So what about patients? This is an example of a patient with a glioblastoma um, because one of the things that will accelerate this process is when clinicians and patients see that there is benefit to doing this and the benefit is still at an early stage of development. We have to be fair. The majority of the analyses show that there are no actionable mutations. When there are actionable mutations, there are three, and there is a drug to go with it. There are three options. One is to try and get compassionate access to the drug. Uh, and that involves an, an oncologist appealing to the company for compassionate use. That takes time. The, the, the other alternative is to repurpose existing drugs. And we're engaging with the determined program, I'll mention that in a minute, uh, to, to get repurpose drugs in and then there's the the efforts to get uh, first in man studies done um, but again that's only in a minority this is an example of a patient whose practice was changed as a result of the uh, um, genomic analysis it's a 48 year old man with a mgmt methylated glioblastoma who originally underwent craniotomy and debulking in 2013 subsequent treatment Disease progressed in August 2020 uh, and, and was commenced on, uh, on, on temozolomide, again, despite previously having it stopped due to bone marrow suppression. Um, further radiological progression, further surgery in 2021, started on alternative uh, chemotherapy, was further, um, further observed, radiological progression in 2022, uh, commenced carboplatin in February of that year, uh, and then had a further surgical resection in March 22 with a good radiological result. Rechallenged with radiotherapy, uh, which is an experimental technique. And samples were taken on, on this, uh, this, this March resection um, where the report um, included comment that there was a high tumor mutational burden. And this is where the number of mutations within the genome is very high. And that is thought to make it more likely that uh, immunotherapies might find an antigen that they can target. And therefore, on that basis, um, the, 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 an, a, a drug was added, the volume up was added um, as an immunotherapeutic to try and improve uh, that patient's condition. And he is still, still alive uh, and still, uh, still well. So what about synergy with drug development trials? This is different, but this is utilizing the same information not for, and taking that analysis and integrating it into new trials, new designs of trial. I mentioned earlier that instead of targeting drugs for breast cancer and drugs for prostate cancer, we can, we can target drugs for mutation A or mutation B across multiple different cancer types. And that's called an umbrella, umbrella design. And this is it in more in, in a little bit, well, so you can read it basically. So the whole thing um, is, is, is designed to get around giving different treatment arms based on an understanding of the biology across multiple different cancer types. And this is where we're going. This is, this is something that's been done for Determine that is a combination of what we call umbrella trials and basket trials. 
and this is this trial design has been led out of um, uh, out of the uh, cancer trials unit uh, here in Birmingham by Professor Cindy Billingham, bringing advanced trial design, something else that was flagged up in the editorial that we're already doing, uh, in order to try and improve access to drugs. Watch this space. Nothing, nothing magical has happened yet, um, but we are putting that infrastructure in place. And last but not least, understand what, what are the challenges and actions going forward? We urgently need to secure whole genome support for, for Scotland and Wales and to have dialogue uh, with the relevant healthcare systems to provide that and dialogue with the English systems and with GEL to see what we can do as a temporizing measure until these the kind of infrastructure evolves north, and, north of the border, as it were. We need to meet with genomic uh, leads and, and arrange meetings that uh, bring together everybody, all the stakeholders involved, including Genomic England and the NHS England. We need to consider alternatives to a methylation array because the methylation array is, is, is clunky. It's still not yet set up outside of a research pathway in, in, uh, in, in just about all of the uh, GLHs that I've talked to. Um, it's still something that is on undergoing validation in quite a few processes. And as Olaf mentioned, Nanopore is presenting alternatives that we should be exploring. There is also the, the, what you may have heard of the Precision Medicine Program based in, based in Cambridge to understand what happens if you have uh, the luxury of lots of funding to do uh, multiple different types of tests. And we need to build on our current GTAB experience. In, in Birmingham, we have approximately 30 to 40 patients who have gone through the NHS whole genome program. There is a backlog of four months reporting that because the clinical scientists um, who are responsible for interpreting that data are working flat out covering the whole spectrum of cancers and there simply aren't enough of them to do it. We've had initial conversations with the GLH leads across the seven hubs and so I have a better understanding of which regions are doing whole genome, whole genome uh, sequencing for brain cancer. Uh, and there is huge diversity. Some regions have got it up and running, as for example, the Central and South uh, GLH. Others are starting to do so, the Northwest and Northeast. Um, others, for example, the Southwest are yet to start doing whole genome sequencing at all and are focused on panels including panels for, for, for brain tumors. We've also engaged with the Mindaroo Precision Medicine people. It's worth pointing out that their turnaround time is between 10 and, and 21 days, not 408. Um, and the reason that they can achieve that is because they're doing it all locally. And if they have the funding that if they have blocks in the pathway, uh, the NHS pathway, they can, they can get around it using their research infrastructure. But it's worth pointing out that because those, those patients' data are not going through an accredited NHS pathway, they cannot use that information to inform clinical decision-making through the NHS. So there's a lot of stuff that we have to do, and there's a lot of need to, to, to get dialogue going. And so this is my last bit, my last point, and I apologize for overrunning, but the, 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 we're organizing a meeting in Birmingham on the 29th of, of March. And I would look forward to bringing people together, including patients, including patient advocates. Because at the end of the day, this is all about patients. Um, but we have a huge, um, a huge mountain ahead of us in order to get all this infrastructure working and working smoothly. Thank you for your attention and apologies for, for overrunning and interruptions. Uh, you haven't overrun at all, Colin. And there was such a complexity of information there, which you shared so eloquently <coughs> and with clarity. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to wrap up. I'm aware of time. We've just got over five minutes. I've got one question which I'd like to throw out to Colin, Alona and Olaf. Olaf. But Richard Mayer from Cambridge, unfortunately, was on holiday this week because he was going to come along and talk about how they've managed to get it down to 21 days. But I'm just aware that this is time critical. If it's taking 408 days and you're diagnosed with a, a glioblastoma then the chances are by the time the results come back, it's potentially going to be too late. But I think too, focusing on the whole pathway, you know, you, you 
you highlighted that we need to, to be doing the whole genome sequencing at diagnosis, again, at recurrence, because we know when a GBM recurs, it's not the same as it was at initial diagnosis. And um, post- I, I would, Helen, I would caveat that in, in the, a lot of, it, it's early days, but the literature and, and the analysis that, that we've done through the GLASS consortium in paired primary and recurrent suggests that the major the major targets are likely to persist in the recurrent setting right okay so in terms of managing expectation and prioritizing what we do we need to start with with getting it done at at initial presentation um and and that involves getting the consent done as soon as possible Um, yeah that is based in the surgical clinic at the moment certainly in ours um so that we can ensure optimized uh, collection of tissue I, 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 yeah that. thank you and again at, at post-mortem but what I wanted to say is that there too needs to be a shift in the clinical research community that we stop looking at patients at one particular point in the pathway they need to be regarded as potential um, candidates for research for the whole of the patient pathway not just at diagnosis or at recurrence so once we get that in place I think that's going to be hugely beneficial I'm sensing too that the desire absolutely 100% is there as it, as is the ambition but we can't scale and grow at the moment because of lack of of resource which is going to be something that needs to be addressed and i think stories that story you shared of the patient is so powerful and i think those have a key part to play in in changing the dynamic that's out there so that we can you know get things in a better place for the people that it matters most to so my question is if you're diagnosed with a brain tumor what is the one thing that you could do to help yourselves get onto this? You know, this, um, I like the infinity loop that Alona a, a referred to. What should you be doing to ensure that you have the best outcome for your situation in terms of whole genomic sequencing? So I, I think you have, you have to start at the beginning because if you don't get tissue collected, then everything else is, is moot. So you have to start by asking your surgeon is tissue going to before you have your operation is tissue going to be collected for whole genome sequencing and if they say yes ask them how many patients are you have you already done this for and if they if they can't answer those questions then you can ask for tissue you should ask for t- demand that tissue is collected and it is sent to a center where that processing can happen. And that if you find yourself in that position as a patient or as a patient advocate, contact the charities, Brains Trust, Brain Tumor Charity, Brain Tumor, it doesn't matter, and and raise merry hell that this is not happening. Uh, Write to your MP. Make a noise. Because one of the problems that we have with brain cancer is that for, for reasons that remain a little bit of a mystery to me even now is that advocacy is different for brain cancer compared to many other cancers and and i don't understand why it is that prominent people they get brain cancer and and they have the disease and and it's difficult to to raise the profile even so we've had presidents sons of presidents senators sportsmen major pop stars most recently tom parker who've died of a brain tumour, and there's a brief flicker in awareness, and then it dies down again. You have someone decide they're going to have a prophylactic mastectomy because they've got a a BRCA1 mutation, and it's all over the news for weeks. We need to try and and, and improve how we can can advocate and raise merry hell. Okay, thank you. So there is a a significant role that patients and their caregivers need to play in this, and I think we charities have a role in terms of educating um, the public. So Alona, Olaf, any last words? Well, I'm not for famous last words. This <laughs> is going to be an ongoing discussion. I've already noticed that there's a request to have a follow-up <coughs> session <laughs> about this topic when we have a bit more to report. And I encourage everybody to speak to their local representatives and raise the importance of this because only through collective work we can change the inertia in the system step by step.
yeah so thank, thank you. you very much for no thank, you. No, thank yeah, you no yeah i agree thank you. um will final question how do our speakers feel about the future cautiously optimistic but i think we need to manage expectations we're, we're not going to we're not going to have the great leap forward um but we are going to make progress Merry hell coming, says Liz. Merry hell, that's it. Go out there and raise Merry hell. <laughs> Will, did you want to say any last words? Oh, Alona's wants something to say. I think we have to unmute them, Jody Carroll. The host would like me to unmute. That's not something. Alona, Alona just wants to say something, Will. You go for it, Alona. Yeah, I've been with Genomics England for seven years from the start of the 100,000 genome projects and we sequenced first uh, 13,000, well, 15,000 cancer patients. And it's been the, the most challenging job, but, you know, I'm still here because I'm sharing calling optimism. It's, it, and I find it very rewarding and thank you so much for joining us, supporting, and let's stay connected. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Well, uh, no, just hey, huge thank you, um, Olaf, Colin, Alona, for for shedding some light on this this dark corner for us all today. Um, every time I sort of come into this space, I feel like things have moved forward. At the moment, it feels like inquiry, inquisition, exploration, learning was the word I heard. Are really, really important. Um, and I just think, you know, Colin, to echo what you said, the more we talk about this with each other, with our doctors, um, you know, the more noise we can make, the better. And I'm just hugely grateful. A final thing um, to the people that have joined us who are, who are living with a diagnosis. We're here to help. Um, we'll do what we can, when we can, where we can. Um, <laughs> if you could help us too, just by engaging with the feedback. Um, I think you've got some questions that have come out before and after or will be coming out after this webinar, that'll be really, really helpful for us because it means we can do more of the same in the future. But everyone there, thank you so much. And we'll meet here again 10, 11 months down the line and see what progress has been made. So thank you, everybody. Go off and have your lunch break. There you are, 12.30, spot on. Okay.